Hey everyone. <laughs> Look who I brought to the party. <laughs> that makes me happy. Oh, where's my, sorry, it's hot in here. I'm like wearing my tank top. See, this is what happens when you're in a pandemic. You forget you're in sweats and pajamas. <laughs> Next week I'm gonna have platinum hair, so. <laughs> Anyways, hope you all are doing well. And um, yes, I, I know some of you can relate to that, but um, so grace, we're asking for grace. <laughs> I know, what are all the people doing who now they're living with someone they don't recognize? Because right. Because Botox gone, their Botox, hairdresser's gone. Botox, I'm going to be platinum next week. I'm I cut like, my own hair now. Yeah, I did too. I cut my hair too. I'm sure some of you have. But, um, but I love the conversation we were having this morning and I wanted, um, I thought it'd be a really good idea to share it with you guys. We were talking about where we were when the world stopped. So question is, where were you the day the world stopped? I still remember where I was during 9-11. I remember exactly where I was, how I felt, what was going on. And I remember where I was the minute that this happened. I remember there was sort of a building with this, unlike with 9-11, there was like a little bit of a building up and we were all like, is this real? Is this not real? What's happening? Is this gonna affect us? And then bam, it just, the hammer dropped. Now I'm one of those people who's a little bit of an early responder to stuff like this, but. Um, Does that mean prepper? A little bit, I'm a little bit of a prepper, so. Um, <laughs> and let me just be clear, I was on the radio in London last week and when I sort of hinted Tana was a prepper, He's like, oh, they're the ones that are taking everything off No, we're off the, the ones shelf. that didn't have to hoard. No, they <laughs> took it off we're the like, shelf told you when so. there was plenty. <laughs> told you so. Anyways, I've been prepping for like 20 years, right? I've been like slowly setting stuff aside. But anyways, um, this is not one of those things that I want to have to say I told you so, though, unfortunately. But I remember I was with Chloe sitting on set. And she'd just gotten a new um, acting job. She was really excited. The world... I remember her, she's like, the whole world's unfolding for me. She was so excited. She just got her driver's license. She just got a job and she was just like blossoming. And then it felt for her like the hammer just dropped and her, she lost her independence. And of course, to a 16 year old, it feels like everything's about them anyways. So it was hard for her to sort of wrap her brain around it. But I remember just sitting there going, wait, what this is, is this happening? And trying to comfort her, but at the same time, trying to wrap my brain around how serious this is. And we've got a house to take care of. And I got to make it home in three hours of traffic and you know, what's happening. And so it was just, it's a crazy feeling, but I am, and I was curious how everyone else responds during these times. Cause we all respond differently. I'm a trauma nurse by training. I immediately went into like sort of kick butt gear and was like, do I have food? Do I have water? Do I have toilet paper? Do I have like, you know, what do I need? We've got, you know, six people in the house to take care of. And so I was just going through my checklist and at the same time trying to calm down a 16 year old and, not act panicked and you know so it was really interesting and you were i remember you calling me while i was on set with chloe and you were getting on a plane to new york and i was like what wait what you can't go yeah, no it was march 10th uh, the end of mental illness my new book up here um had just come out and the, the mel robbins show television show that's nationwide uh they were gonna do the whole show with me yeah. I had scanned Mel Robbins. We had sort of charted out all the segments. I was really excited. She'd been to our clinic in Manhattan. Uh, and I was in my bathroom, but ambivalent about going. And I'm never ambivalent never. if I can go and talk about our work. And I'm sort of ambivalent about getting on a metal tube with all these germs. And I had been traveling the week before and I'm in my bathroom, I'm packed, I'm ready to go. And I get a call from the producer that they were gonna close the building. And she was so sad. I was not that sad. Right. <laughs> I was just and not remember, that sad. And I had said to you, I said, I love you, but you're gonna have to sleep in the guest room. Like you're not gonna be able to come into the house. She was gonna quarantine I was gonna for quarantine him. So, and that was before the order was given. But I was like, we're not, I can't, because one of us has to be healthy for the family and I tend to have a weakened immune system. But, um, but it was just, it was kind of a crazy day. And I started wondering where were people, what were you guys thinking, what were you doing and how did you handle it? Some people I know just sort of kicked into gear. Other people kind of panicked. Um, you know, your kids probably somewhat panicked and um, it was just sort of an interesting time. And Well, and then we sat down to teenagers. Right. The 10 year old, she's just been easy the whole time, right. pretty much. 
but the two teenagers that are used to going all, all the, the time, time um, they were not no. happy about the whole and thing. And they felt like they were being punished for something they didn't do. It was, of course, you know, more about them and, oh my God, the sky is falling literally. Um, like everything is shutting down because... So Carla's like you. She said, I started to try to control everything. Everything, yes. <laughs> I Literally, no one was allowed to walk in the house with their shoes. I was bleaching everything, stripped the, the surfaces off of everything by cleaning everything. <laughs> Everyone had to wear masks way before they said masks. Because I'm a nurse. Didn't make sense to me not wearing masks. But I, I had masks already, so... Um, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, and then you had a conversation with Chloe. So I had a conversation with Chloe and it was really interesting. Um, and I think we, we already talked a little bit about this, but what the, what was so interesting about the conversation that I had with Chloe was she, when she finally got a hold of herself, cause she kind of threw a bit of a temper tantrum, which is I'm not used to that kind of reaction from her in, in the past. She was always our little 45 year old soccer mom. And suddenly she wasn't acting like that. And she was angry, sort of, she was acting angry with us, even though I didn't think she was angry with us, but she was angry. She was temperamental. And then she came to me and she apologized and she said, you know, I feel like I'm being punished for something I didn't do. And I've never been put on restriction before. And now I'm suddenly being put on restriction when I didn't do anything, when my life is just opening up, I can't go anywhere. There's no, no one's telling me when this is going to end. And then she started crying and, and she, she even realized it was a defense mechanism for the fear she was feeling. She's like, I've never experienced something like this. I have no idea. Are people going to die or is my family going to die? Like she, she started to freak out. And then she flipped into, as soon as she realized the fear was there, then she went, no. No, just no, no, I'm not doing this. This isn't happening. And everything she said reminded me of when I found out I had cancer. And so I went through all of those exact steps. So you were 23. I was 23. The world was opening up for you. Every I had the world by the tail. And I was just like, everything's going right in my life. I'm just like, everything's happening. And then I literally... Like within the same week that I was getting all this great news, I found out I had cancer and I sort of didn't hear the doctor. And I'm like, this, it's not registering. <laughs> it's not registering for me that I have cancer. And when he said it, I'm like, he said it was a slow growing cancer. So that he goes, the bad news is you have cancer. The good news is it's slow growing. We can get this. And I'm like, oh, okay, good. Well, that's all I heard. And I'm like, then I'll see you in a few months. Because I've got stuff to do. Like I'm busy and I can't stop well, right now. You had a big job and you wanted to do that. Right. And I and I wasn't ready to, to quit. And so he goes, I don't think you're understanding. I'm trying to make you feel better, but I think you're not hearing what I'm saying. We need to do this right now. And then when I finally, when it finally sank in that I had cancer, I got really angry. i really angry. And I was just like, no, no, I'm not doing this. This isn't fair. This is, this is crap, quite frankly. I'm not going to do it. And so, and I just remembered that anger that welled up inside. And then of course I crumbled and fell apart and went into a depression and all that stuff. But, um, but it was a really interesting thing to see that her reaction to a pandemic, my point is everyone reacts differently to different things, but I think we often have sort of a similar structure and it reminded me of the steps of grief. And so we are grieving as a nation right now for, I mean, so many people are grieving for people they've lost but they're grieving jobs, they're grieving opportunities, they're grieving because they are getting depressed being in their homes. Some people are actually thriving, which is really interesting to me. But we are all reacting in a different way and we've got this framework and I'm curious about how people are handling it. And so what we wanna to talk to you about today is how to develop mental toughness. Right. And is, is people wanna know what you're drinking. I'm drinking <laughs> every time I drink this. It's lemon water, whoops, sorry, hold on to that. Lemon water with ginger and cayenne pepper. It's, uh, it'll kill anything, I'm convinced, so. <laughs> and I'm drinking sweet and spicy tea, which yeah. I really like. Um, okay, so mental toughness. Yeah, mental grit. How do you develop that? What, what are the steps to do? Because you need it yeah. in a pandemic. Uh, you guys have heard me say this a lot. Mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. Right. Now, wash your hands, but you have to get your mind right. 
Well, and I and my hope for our crowd is if you've been following us, you've been developing some skill and you don't go through what I went through, although I know some of you already have. Um, you don't do it the way I did it by crashing and burning and having to rebuild from scratch, right? Uh, but some of you have and you are. And, um, you know, a wise man learns from his own mistakes and a wiser man learns from someone else's. And we're hoping that some of you, even if you've, you know, had a hard time, maybe you're not going to crash and burn all the way you're going to learn work some skill from some of the things that we're able to teach you and some of the things that even us or some of the, our other community have done and learned in the process. So for me, it was crashing and burning clearly. And that was a hard thing for me to rebuild. And I had to learn grit the hard way. So, so what's the first step? Uh, I think recognizing it. So recognizing it, I mean, at least for me it was recognizing it. And that's why I stopped. That's why we asked that question. Where were you? What were you doing? What did you think the minute that it happened? Um, and that can go back to, I can think back all the way to many things that have happened in my life. I remember the day when I heard that I had cancer, you know, 9-11, when this happened. Or when you were assaulted. When or I was assaulted at 15 on the street. When your uncle was murdered right. in a drug deal gone wrong when you're four. There are these touch points in our life when the challenger exploded or... Um, when President Kennedy was shot, see, I'm old enough, I remember that. Um, so there are these touch points in your life and someone said that their mother just died in January. That's one of these times you just never forget it. Mm -hmm. So recognize those touch points in your life, but then how do you respond? When right. you've gone through tough times, how have you responded? Right. And some people respond with denial. Some people respond with anger. Um, some people some respond people, with all of the above. <laughs> some people respond with blame. And those things aren't helpful. So admit, okay, this is going on and this is hard. Right, it's hard. It's, it's hard. Then that's, and that was really helpful for Chloe. Um, you know, as a parent, your first response in a pandemic is you need to knock that off because this is a pandemic and we have to be serious, but it's not helpful. Well, unfortunately, because we have some skill with that, we didn't do that first. We listened first and she was able to work through that and come up with that, what we talked about. So she actually talked she herself had insight. through it. She talked herself through it. But if you listen, but then there came a point where I did say, I love you and I'm trying to be really sensitive and I want to talk through this with you and I want you to talk through it. And because the safety of you and our home and our family members and our society are the most important thing right now, sensitivity comes second if you don't understand what I'm saying. Well, so safe, safety always comes second. Right, there's... Um, right, I mean, if a child is going to run exactly. in the street, sensitivity you don't is go... Tell me how you're feeling. No. So, I mean, there did come a point where it's like, l let me be clear. I want to help you with this and you're going to do this. So, so whether, let's be right, clear. But listening just helps um, the trauma so much. So yeah. make sure at home you are being a good listener mm -hmm. and you have empathy for the people there. Yeah, that was one thing I didn't really have growing up. My mom was always working. She really did try, but she was always working. And whenever there was any indication that anything might be wrong concerning me, she would just lose it. And so the just losing it part, the constantly being emotional made it impossible for me to sort of... Well, work and she has ADD, which we talked right. about and I've written about, which it was means so not helpful. as soon as you say one thing, she's going to interrupt you and then... And then you blowing up it. and crying and, you know, it's, it makes it really hard for a child. So if you, what I've so discovered... So if you have ADD, get it treated uh, because otherwise it's just so stressful on your babies. Right. And if you are okay, they're going to be okay. Right. It's, it's just, they're so much better if you're, if you are strong, you, they're relying on you. You're their anchor. So it's just, they're going to do a lot better if you're doing well. So be the change. Exactly. All right. So admit when it's hard for you, and then you wanted to talk about getting control over your thoughts. Getting control over our thoughts, but I thought, I thought before we did that, do you remember when we were talking about how generational, how, 
how our parents handle, because this isn't the first time this has happened, this is the first time this particular thing has happened this way, but this isn't the first time the world has experienced trauma, right? So my grandmother was, um, we talked about this, and so my grandmother was in, um, she was born in 1910, and she, um, in greater Syria at the time, so Lebanon now, um, greater Syria, and she went through the Great Famine, and so, which killed 250,000 people, she remembers the Turks riding through and she remembers people dying that she loved and she knew and she got lost in the woods when she was five. And she still remembers that, well not now, she remembered that until the day she died, she was traumatized by it. Um, she remembered that and she was highly traumatized. She got lost for three days in the woods at five years old by herself and being terrified of animals and she almost froze and when they found her, her hair had gotten frozen. She tried to get some water out of a pond and overnight it froze in her hair and they had to shave her hair off and she was she never forgot that and the way she handled that trauma and how she processed it and always hoarding food and hoarding tin foil and little plastic dishes and how she now you think that's why i'm a prepper i okay he's convinced that's why i became a prepper. i think if you so, look back in your family history you're gonna see patterns of behavior that but I don't you and I don't hoard. Then you inherit. <laughs> I do not hoard. <laughs> My definition of a prepper is they're prepared for something that is unlikely to happen, but no, in this case, no. it See, happened. See, that's, that's the part that makes me... I'm sorry, but I told you so just happens to be some of my favorite words. I just can't help it. If you would just say thank you for prepping, I would not have to say I told you so. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry, we digress so what stories are in your family mm -hmm. so for example for me my grandfather came again from the middle east uh when he was 19 his younger brother borrowed his sister's car and apparently wasn't a good driver and ended up getting killed he ended up on railroad tracks in a train came and crushed his car and mm. killed his brother. And my uncle never forgot that. In fact, he never drove because of it and never forgave mm -hmm. his sister. And so how did his trauma, and this happened to him before he made my dad, so that stress affected um, my father, which then will affect me. So trauma can be passed down generationally. Mm -hmm. And we just want you to take a minute and reflect on what traumas have been passed down right. to you. Are you reacting are you reacting strictly because it's your reaction or are you reacting because it's been a pattern in your family? Right, and maybe even one you don't remember, but but there's or a maybe one that's just not yours. Right, it's somebody else's. Right, and so I just thought that was really interesting um, because sometimes our reactions aren't our own in crisis. So it's just a really good thing to be aware of and conscious of, and and yeah, we want to talk about how to control our thoughts during these times. And so we this is not new to any of you, but we thought we would go through just an example of doing it, how we've been handling it with our kids, with each other, even myself. I mean, because one thing we talked about was having grace during this time because we sat all the kids down the first week and we're like, look, this is going to take a lot of grace. We're going to all be in the house together way more than we're used to being in the house together, doing things we're going to be on top of each other. So we're going to step on each other's toes now and then, and we're going to need grace as a family. It's just, it's a given, right? We always want to have that, but right now we especially need it. And so there are moments where I'm just like really irritated because I just got done cleaning out something. Of course, I cleaned all my cabinets like a lot of you have and organized everything. And then I come along and the kids have messed it up. So I get annoyed, right? So, but I have to pull myself together because if I'm okay, they're okay. But there are moments where I behave in a way where I say something that maybe I didn't want to say. And so, and there's a thought in my head behind it. So what we want you to do is, is latch onto that. Stop yourself and figure out what the thought is. So for me, the thought is that I wasn't appreciated, okay, during that time. Or for you, maybe it's more crisis related. Um, Chloe's thought was, it, this isn't fair, right? I didn't do anything wrong. This isn't fair. Um, so think about what your thoughts are that are torturing you. Um, if they're making and you for miserable. For some people, it's I'm going to go bankrupt. I'm mm -hmm. going to die. 
my parents are going to die. Um, it's a which conspiracy. Which is one of the most common thoughts somebody you care about is going to die or you're going to lose your job or you won't have the money you need. It's basically disaster thinking. Mm -hmm. We call those fortune telling ants, mm -hmm. automatic negative thoughts. The thoughts that come into your mind just automatically and ruin your day. Right. So, and we all get them, and especially right now. Right? And so we want to walk you through how to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So we call them ants, right? Automatic negative thoughts. You've seen my little friend. Since I'm also a child psychiatrist, I have puppets, and I can buy toys and take them off my taxes. <laughs> okay. And I have... That was just an TMI. Anteater <laughs> to get rid of the ants. Um... But you're going to actually walk them through a very specific process right? on how to do it. And what thought are you going to choose? Well, why don't you choose one? Well, you're going to walk us through. So let's find one that's hard for you. Like I'm not appreciated. Let's do that one. I'm sure some people are feeling that. Or, and we can do that one. Or we can do... It's not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. Um, it's not fair that this is happening to people, but it, it, but life isn't fair. And one thing I always told my daughter growing up, you know, getting cancer for a baby isn't fair, right? But fair is a place with bad food and farm animals. It has nothing to do with life. And so, she had no idea what you were talking about. No, she had no idea. Where we live, it's Los Angeles fair. And I, I used to say, you know, life isn't fair. It's a place in Pomona with bad food and farm animals. And she just was quiet. So I thought she understood what I was saying. She had no idea what I was saying. She thought there was this place called the Pomona. State fair. <laughs> she thought that there was this place called Pomona that where everybody was fair. And she wanted to go there. And I'm... <laughs> so <laughs> so I actually like that right now. Because, in fact, it's sort of not fair. Right. So whenever you feel sad or mad, or nervous, or out of control, write it down. Right. Writing it down helps to get it out of your head. Write it down, and then walk them through the exercise. Right. So this isn't fair. Um, this isn't fair, is it true? So, so what would you say, is, is it true? So that's the first question. We're gonna give you five questions, mm -hmm. and we stole them from our friend Byron Katie. Right. Uh, but they're so good. They're just I so use easy and so great all the time. So I always give her credit. But uh, so you write down the thought. It's is not it, fair. Question number one. Is it true? Is it true? And this is not about positive thinking. Neither one of us are positive thinking mm -hmm. fans. She's a prepper. Um, that's not a positive thinking. Positive bias. <laughs> I'm also a trauma nurse. I don't do positive thinking. I do right. accurate thinking. Accurate thinking. There's a verse in um, the New Testament, John 8, 32. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. Okay. This isn't fair. Is that true? I think many would say it's not fair. And, and here's the thing. Don't try and argue with it. Okay, don't try and argue with your thoughts. But so we're going to end up challenging it. But if it really feels like it's not fair and you just can't turn that thought around, okay, it's not fair. The second question is, can I absolutely know it's true? More than God, can I know that this is not fair? You know, that gets pretty esoteric and heavy if you start really digging into that one. It's like, well, I don't know. But, it's, but as soon as you say, I don't know, you can't know 100%. It begins to crack the thought. And I love this quote that I've read to you in some of my other live casts from C.S. Lewis, who in 1948 wrote about the atomic bomb mm -hmm. and how people were so freaked out about the atomic bomb. And he basically said, um, yes, it's bad, but you also didn't live in the 16th century when the plague visited right. London nearly ever every year or in the Scandinavian age when any night a Viking Vikings. could have landed on your shore and slit your throat or um, quite frankly at any time you can be diagnosed with cancer you can be in a car accident you can be walking you to can, high school and grabbed and drugged down an alley like I you was can when do that 15. or you can be four years old and your uncle is murdered in a right. drug deal gone Wrong. And is it fair? Bad things happen to all of us. And the only certainty 
in all of this is at some point all of us are going to die. And I he think goes, we're supposed to make them feel better. He goes on. <laughs> he goes on to say, if we know that, then rather than spending our time fretting and worrying, why, if death comes, why doesn't death find us doing sensible yeah, things? I love that. Like loving our spouse, or bathing the children, or playing music, uh, doing sensible. Right, and one thing, um, and we, we're digressing a little, but one thing we like to ask a question, we and we've taught the kids this in the house, is because right now, you know, little things are happening, and um, you know, one of the little ones, she, she dropped some food and got all freaked out, thought she was gonna get in trouble, and so we had to have a talk with her, and I'm like, does it have eternal value? And of course she was completely confused. And I'm like, if it doesn't have eternal value, if we're not going to remember it five years from now, or five months from now, or five hours from now, then it doesn't have eternal value and it is not worth focusing on, right? That is just not important at this moment. Right, and learning how to forgive yourself is important. So question number one, is it true? Yes, it seems like it's not fair. Question number two, is it absolutely true? With 100% certainty. Well, virtually every generation goes through something awful. And unfair. And so he, here it is uh, for us, how are we going to react to it? Right, so and we can't know 100%, question, I mean, I can't know 100%. Percent that it's not fair. So I don't know what, you know what the universe is doing and God is thinking and whatever, that's just beyond me. It's above my pay grade. Um, so I can't know for sure that it's not true. How do I feel when I have the thought? So that's question three. It's not, th it's not fair, yeah, it's three. How do I feel when I have the thought it's not fair? I feel um, scared. I feel powerless. I feel hopeless. I can apply that to every one of the disasters that I have been through. And hopelessness was part of it and powerlessness, um, which for me, feeling like a victim is like the worst thing ever. Um, that is like the kiss of death for me. I don't like feeling like a victim. I like feeling empowered. So, um, yeah, I don't like that feeling. And then, I feel so trapped. how do you feel when you have the thought, whatever the thought is, the one we're working on is it's not fair, um, and you feel hopeless. I'm trapped, and trapped. Like a victim. Many people with I'm not fair feel angry. Yeah. Um, and so they'll be angry at the president, they'll be angry at the Chinese, Gotta they'll have be somebody. angry at um, the pharmaceutical, I mean, they'll just be angry at somebody. And then a side question to three is when you believe that thought and feel these feelings, how do you then treat the important people in your life? And yourself. How do you treat yourself and others? And so if I feel like it's not fair and I start to feel like a victim and I go through all of those things, if I feel powerless and like a victim and I feel trapped, for me, that's a really bad thing. For me, I start to get antsy and agitated and like I'm trying to take control again. Someone oh. mentioned it, right? Someone mentioned I've been trying to control everything. Well, that's exactly what happens. I start trying to control things. And it's one thing if I'm trying to control things in a way that keeps people safe. It's another thing when I'm trying to control things I can't control, right? Where I make people miserable. So th those are two separate things. So I start trying to control situations I probably can't control and make other people upset and I start trying to control myself and I get angry with myself for feeling feeling like a victim because I hate the word victim. So. And then, so question three is so important because it actually teaches us that it's our thoughts, often thoughts that really aren't 100% true, that drive anxiety, depression, relationship, problems, insomnia, obsessiveness, but just learning to question them. And then that leads to question number four. Question number four is who would I be without the thought? So who would I be without the thought? It's not fair. If I couldn't think the thought, if God wouldn't allow it in my head, if it was just blocked, I can't think the thought. It's not fair. If I can't think that thought, who would I be? Well, I wouldn't think it's not fair. I would be more peaceful. I wouldn't feel trapped. I wouldn't feel like a victim. So another way to say that is I would how feel would free. I feel right. if I didn't have the thought, if I couldn't right. have the thought, and just what you said is what people say all free. the time. Free. Mm -hmm. 
that it's the hell you experience. Well, the opposite is of trapped is free. In your head. Mm -hmm. And mental toughness is basically telling yourself the truth and then acting out of what's true uh, and helpful rather than what's hurtful. Do you remember the movie Divergent? I'm digressing them again, but there's a, there's a moment in the movie Divergent where she's she's in, in the, the little mental exercises they do and every time she comes to a place where the task seems impossible mentally, she or physically or whatever it is, she does this thing where she like looks at a reflection of herself and she goes, this isn't real and it breaks it. And it's just, it was so interesting to me. I'm like, well, that's a little bit like what we do, right? This is So there's real. an interesting question from Veronica. Um, this is very informative, but seriously, how many fights have you two had during quarantine? Have we had a fight? I don't think so. I got a little irritated with the kids a couple times. Yeah, no, it's the one good thing. You yeah. want to be in quarantine with someone you like. It's so helpful. <laughs> no, it's so helpful. I've had some relationships this week. No, I'm trying to great. actually think. <laughs> um, I may have gotten annoyed once because I wanted to talk to you about the kids. <laughs> but I make her cappuccino. In the <laughs> yeah. Morning, so she's you know generally <laughs> nice to me. No, I, um, we haven't fought. Okay, so question number four. Who would you be? How would you feel if you didn't have the thought? People often say free. That's so important because what you realize the hell you're in often is of your own making. I have one of my patients um, who I just couldn't get her out of her head. So I bought it on Amazon, um, jailer keys, mm, so you know, like the old kind, you know, these big keys. And I bought her these keys that you get people out of jail with. I'm like, here are the keys. This is what you need to let yourself out of the jail these thoughts are putting you in. And I like that. The fifth question, my favorite question, it's it's the question that just blows you away, is turn the original thought. So what's the opposite of the original thought that is bothering you? And there's so, usually a couple ways to do it. Right. Katie talks about three different right. ways. To the opposite to yourself and then to other people. Mm -hmm. And so the opposite of it's not fair is it is fair. Mm -hmm. And then when you turn it to yourself is I'm not fair to me. Right. And to you, it's I'm not fair to you. Or it's not fair to me or it's not, not fair, fair to you. To you. Um, but, but let's just work on it is fair. Because it doesn't sound right. In right? what way is what ha what's happening now fair? That's a tough one. Well, there's been pandemics since the beginning of human history. Right, so fair Even or not. Even before human history, right? I mean, the dinosaurs got wiped out in large part, you know, perhaps by an asteroid. So... Um, these things happen, and really, it's our ability to respond rather than Take responsibility. expecting. That's what I was going to just say. It's about taking responsibility. So if something doesn't feel fair, maybe it's about taking responsibility. So the prepper in me is about to come out when I answer this. Maybe it's less about being fair and more about maybe we weren't as prepared as we could have been. You're, you're not meaning we as in you and me. No, collectively. Because you're, you're, you... We're working on it. Um, but, but when we start to think Oh, I love happen. this. This is one uh, from Mary. This is the best my life has ever been. Isn't We've it? been hearing that a lot. It's so And in so many ways, we got our teenagers back. Yeah. And we have just dearly loved... We love this the precious time. time. ...we have with, with our kids. Um, so it is fair. Is there any examples of it is fair? Well... Virtually every generation has had a major trauma that they have had. Right. To so deal why would with. we think it's going to be different? It's right. going to continue to repeat. I mean, in 1982, when I was an intern at Walter Reed, the AIDS epidemic was just going like wildfire. And I'm an intern. 
which means I'm drawing blood from AIDS patients. Mm -hmm. And I was completely freaked out uh, about having to do that from Vietnam, Korea, World War II, World War I, the American Civil War. You just look at any society, they have had challenges that make this pandemic pale. So this is a, this question is actually a hard one for me to even dig into too much because the nurse in me, when I worked in pediatric oncology, that's not fair. How do you even answer a question like that? It's just this is it's part of being human, and I think the best we can do is try to plan as much as we can for um, the things we can plan for. Um, and to think that things aren't going to happen is probably not that smart. Yeah, and Angela writes, the pause button was paused at the perfect time. The movie was playing too fast. And you actually see the earth beginning to heal. I, I've never the seen the sky's blue. pollution has begun to go away. Don't wish this on no. anybody. Don't wish it on my no, parents. No, and I want to take sure. a moment for, because this question for anybody watching who has a family member, like we've got family members, several family members who have COVID. Um, your your mom and dad aren't the only ones. So this is a really tough one. And anyone who has family members or who has family members who have passed because of this awful um, virus that's going around, we are not trying to say it is fair. That is not what we are saying. And we want to um, express our, you know, deepest sympathies for anyone who's suffering because this is a... But suffering is normal. It's, it's human. Suffering is human. And I always love what you say is responsibility doesn't mean it's your fault. It means taking... It means your right. ability right. to respond. And not be a victim. And how are we going to respond? Mentally tough people, they have just as many problems as everybody else, but they respond in ways that are helpful. And it doesn't mean you don't cry. No. When I think about my parents, sometimes I cry. It doesn't mean you don't feel the sadness or the pain, but then you react in ways, is this going to be helpful? You know, at Amen Clinics, and we've been open during this time, it's been hard because a number of my employees uh, got COVID. We had to close, physically close, uh, our Manhattan clinic for a couple of weeks. And it's hard. But how are we going to respond? Am I going to be proud of myself in July or September as a leader? Am I doing the right long-term things for my family, for my business? Are you doing the right long-term things for your family, for your business, for your health. Right, and it, it, that sort of takes us back to, it reminds me of what we were talking about in the very beginning. Where were you, but how did you respond? So for me, I kicked into trauma, that was my training. Trauma nurse, ABCs, airway breathing circulation. What do we gotta do? <laughs> I was like, and then, and that can be annoying to other family members. Cause like, I'm not kidding. It's like, you guys need to be doing this, 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 this. Here's my list. This is my checklist. This is what we got to get from the store. This is like, I'm like not joking about it. Um, so that can be a little bit irritating, but that's how I cope, right? That's my way of coping with it. Some people fell apart. We watched that with the teenagers. They fell apart. Um, you, this is what, maybe this is why we don't fight at times like this, which is what I really love. He's my rock. Okay. So he's so calm and he knows that I, that that's how I am. And he knows that I need to do that. And trying to tell me not to do that is not going to work. <laughs> like, it's just not going to work. But helping me do it in a calm way is, is what you tend to do. You tend to be the rock and the calm, the calming force. And I'm, I tend to be the dynamo that's just like, let's get out there and get it done. But you can But if calm. I didn't have this mental training that we're giving to you, I'd have been freaked out. And you can just, when you're anxious um, and scared, you tend to make bad decisions. And so what we're trying to give to you with the live chats and the mental hygiene series that you can see on my Facebook page, what we're trying to give to you are tools that you can use, yes, during a crisis, but also they're just helpful for you for the rest of your life.
I'm going to have to stop. Okay, I just want to throw one thing out there for the person who said, my life has never been better. That's actually a good add-on to when you're thinking it's not fair. Um, what was in your, what was there something going on? There was a lot going on for a lot of people and even in society that was just so chaotic. And this hitting the pause button, as you guys said, was maybe just a necessary thing, fair or not, maybe it was a necessary thing in some ways for some people to just regroup. So yeah, really interesting. Yeah. So our prayers are with you. Um, we are hoping this thing calms down sooner rather than later. There's some good signs today. Um, we'll be back. We'll but be en back enjoy this time. It's precious if you make, if you really pay attention to all the blessings in it with your family and friends. And Where you bring your attention always determines how you feel. So, Thank you.